Welcome to the Mile High Five Podcast. I am Carl Jensen, and I am here with my co-host. Doug Cunnington. And today we have a special guest. Diane, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Diana Merriam. I am the Chief Economist of the Economy Conference, and I also host uh, the podcast Optimal Finance Daily. So, so happy to be with you guys today. Yeah, thank you very much, Diane. We first met about two years ago at Camp FI Rocky Mountain, right? Was that two years ago? It seems like... uh, it seems like ages ago because COVID happened between. But I know. But yes, it was. It was 2019. Yeah. I, I remember I got there and uh, you meet two types of people in the world. And the first type you meet are people who are going along for the ride and that's fine. And then you meet people who uh, have a lot of energy and want to do a lot of cool shit. <laughs> and I remember getting there and seeing you talking to everyone and you were talking about economy, which had it happened at the time, just telling everyone, I'm like, oh my God, who is this person? Is she on drugs or something? Amphetamines? <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Diane is not on any drugs that I know of, but you are in the latter smaller group. You're the type of person who is going to perhaps take over the world at some future point. So I remember that. And the other thing I remembered, and this is my own selfish viewpoint was I gave my talk and after I was done talking, you said you gave me probably the one of the best compliments I've ever had in my life. You said you should be a stand up comedian, and that just took me back because I've never liked, like most people, I wasn't enthusiastic about public speaking, it terrified me. And by that time, I'd gotten over most of it, but I still questioned my skills, and you still have nerves and all that type of shit. So you said that, I'm like, wow, that's uh, that that meant a lot to me. So I appreciate that. You probably said it offhanded and probably don't even remember that, but. I, I appreciate that. No, I do. And I still stand by that statement. Um, I actually did stand up comedy for a long time. Uh, not, I wouldn't call myself like a professional comedian. I'm just a person that went to like, did a shit ton of open mics. And so I've seen a lot and I just felt like you were a natural. Yeah. Thank you very much. So open mics, you just go up there and how does that work? You go up for five, 10 minutes or? How, yeah. How does you usually get, you get five minutes. And you go up there and usually the audience is other people doing the open mic. So I think that's what's the hardest thing about open mics is that most people aren't, they're just not paying attention. They're all worried about what they're going to say when they get up there. So it's really hard to tell, like, is your stuff funny or is it just not landing with these people? Open mics are tough. I The first time I ever got on stage, it was actually a booked show that I thought was an open mic. Like on the website, it says it said it was an open mic, but it was really a booked show. And when I got there and realized that it wasn't an open mic, I was like, man, I had just like prepared all weekend for this. I'm not going to let this opportunity go. And so I was talking to the bartender about it. And he's, she said, well, the organizer's sitting right over there. Just go talk to him. So I did. And it turned out that a couple people like just didn't show up. So he had some space in the middle of the show and he just put me in for five minutes in the middle of the show with a warmed up audience. And I did really well. And I'm telling you, like, if that wasn't my first experience, I probably would have never done it, done it again. Because if I would have went to a real open mic, I probably would have been just like, so not recognizing like what the experience could be when you actually make an audience laugh. Um, that was your yeah. first time doing an open mic yeah and it was awesome <laughs> i um i actually read i read from my diary from when i was 12 <laughs> it was oh. like this winnie the pooh diary and uh i just picked some like choice entries that were ridiculous and it went over well that's amazing yeah i couldn't imagine i would shit my pants and then people that paid money that's even scarier uh, Doug, are you going to do an open mic at Camp FI this weekend? We're all going to, all three of us are going to be at Camp FI Rocky <laughs> Mountain. And I heard rumors, Doug, that you might have a musical performance, uh, musical comedy performance, like Flight of the Concords. Is there any truth to that? I'll see what I can work out in three days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. I believe in you, Doug. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to talk about doing, in Diana's words, Hard shit. And one of the hardest oh, yeah. things about you, Diana, is spelling your name. You have a bonus I in your name. Your name is spelled. Isn't it ridiculous? Did your mom just want to uh, 
torment you or something like well, that? Well, I, I like to say that it's her ultimate revenge for 30 hours of labor. I mean, that's the only reasonable explanation. Um, but yeah, it's really ironic, <clears throat> excuse me, that there's this, there's a silent eye in the name of someone who literally never shuts up. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay. So where should we start here? Um, how about your money story? What is, yeah. Uh, t- tell us about that. Yeah. So I discovered the fire movement through the Mr. Money Mustache blog, like a lot of people. And at the time I was 28, I was living in New York City and I was 30 grand in debt for absolutely no reason, aside from not paying attention and just simply living beyond my means. And I think discovering Mr. Money Mustache, it was just like a complete 180 for me. I like to describe finding that blog like a refreshing punch in the face because it just like woke me up. And the way he talks about money for me was just very different than most of what I'd been exposed to thus far. Um, A lot of stuff that you read about like getting out of debt has this tone of like, this is going to be so hard. You know, it's this tone of struggle. And I just felt like Mr. Money Mustache just talked about the opportunity and that a lot of this stuff, it it's like, it's not really a hardship. A lot of this stuff is like a first world problem, right? We are incredibly fortunate. And me like cooking all of my meals is really not a hardship. It's kind of like laughable to me how I used to see reducing my expenses as you know, being afraid that it would feel like deprivation. I think in reality, the thing I didn't expect about it is it opened up this degree of resourcefulness and creativity that I didn't even know I had. Yes, I became a really good cook, but I also like found all these other solutions for getting my needs met. So it took me 11 months to get out of 30 grand of debt just from like completely changing my behaviors and the way I was spending money. So for instance, I stopped buying clothes. I didn't buy any clothing during that time. But obviously, I still have clothing needs, right? And so what I did is I would host these clothing exchanges with my more fashionable friends. (laughs) And everyone would clear out their closets, come to my apartment for like an afternoon of mimosas and music and trying on each other's clothes. And I walked away from those experiences with a closet full of more fashionable free clothes than I probably would have bought myself. And so that to me is like, yeah, I wasn't spending money, but that solution to a clothing need was more satisfying than just like mindlessly swiping a credit card. And I just have so many more examples of things like that, where if you are able to tap into your own creativity, it's like it makes the whole process feel feel a lot different. And it can be a really exciting time. I think for me, it's my favorite part of my money journey is getting out of debt. Before you found the Pete's blog, did you have any plan or idea on what you were going to do with that debt in the future? Make more money. That was the only thing I could think to do. I, you know, it's funny when I think about my twenties and my, the way I thought about money, I knew I had debt, but I just kind of assumed, well, you know, I'm going to be making millions one day. So this debt is going to solve itself. I'll figure it out later was always my thought process. If I just made more money, that would be the solution. And I didn't realize that it my income wasn't so much the problem. It was money management that was the problem. And I just really, I didn't realize that at the time. I have two follow-up questions for you. Do you remember which Mr. Money mustache post? Was there a specific one that resonated with you or was it the blog in general? Well, I definitely like devoured the whole blog with a spoon. I mean, I read every article after I got introduced to it, but I think it was probably the, your debt is an emergency, like creating that kind of hair on fire feeling of this isn't something I'm going to figure out later. This is something I need to do right now is kind of what I, I left that article with. And it, it just created the sense of urgency and recognition that if I don't build the habits and behaviors now, I, when am I ever going to do it? Right? Like this is going to continue to be a problem for me. It's something I need to fix now. Yeah. It'll compound and, and get you for the rest of your life. I'm so damn thankful for that blog because that was a, uh, you think of the inflection points in my life and there's probably four or five big ones meeting my life partner and 
Mr. Money Mustache is definitely one of them. I mean, probably the, the second biggest one, maybe, maybe first. Is, is Mindy listening? Let's hope not. Okay, so <laughs> my other follow-up question was, there was something you said that I really, really liked that I've never heard this viewpoint, and I'll give a little bit of background. Whatever I tell people about this whole frugality thing in early retirement, a lot of the a lot of the pushback you get is, it's a sacrifice. I don't want to give mm. up this and this and this. And I loved how you framed it is that it's not a sacrifice. It's a creative challenge. I can't buy new clothes, so I'm going to have this exchange with mimosas. How cool is that? And I think there's a very important lesson in that. You could take it as a negative. Oh, I can't buy my new blah, blah, blah car. So you could take it that way, or you could change your viewpoint and change your perspective and look at it as an opportunity and be creative about it like you just said. I, I thought that was super cool. And I've never heard anyone say that before. Was there anything that was non-negotiable that you didn't want to sacrifice on or yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So was there anything mm. like uber important? Maybe oh, actually I'll leave it open. I won't suggest anything. Yeah. Um, I think that I really started to just get really clear on what is the value I'm getting out of the money that I'm spending. So like even today, a lot of times when I eat out, I just sit there and I'm like, man, I could have made something better than this. Like not to sound arrogant, but I'm a really good cook. <laughs> I said the so, same thing. Yeah. Right. So it's <laughs> almost like it's not even about the money. It's that I'm just not getting enough value out of this money that I'm spending. And so then I think about like the other things that I've done that cost money. Like for example, I really love in-person events. I know we talked about Camp Fi. We're going to talk about the Economy Conference. Like that is something to me that I get so much value out of being around really interesting people. I'm an extreme extrovert. So Carl, you talked about me like talking to everyone at Camp Fi. Like that's how I get energy. So that's non-negotiable. And one of my favorite events that actually Mr. Money Mustache uh, exposed me to is World Domination Summit. He spoke there one year, and that's how I found out about it. Now, that ticket to go is like $700 a ticket. It's, it doesn't come across as a very frugal decision, right? And then you got to put flight on top of it, accommodations, no meals are included, right? I mean, it's probably $1,500 that I'm spending for that trip. But it is worth every penny because I meet incredible people that I'm still friends with to this day that have opened up opportunities for me. And it's like I leave there every time I go. I leave there feeling like my life is so full of possibility. Like... You can't, it's almost like you can't even buy that feeling, but you can put yourself in situations where you could get exposed to it and maybe that costs money. Um, so I don't know. I guess, I guess like the human connection side of things um, is non negotiable. And sometimes it costs money, like with World Domination Summit. And sometimes it's really easy to do, like when I go for long distance hikes with my friends or when I host dinner parties. Yeah. I think, uh, that's another really good point too. So you always hear that stupid cliche term, money can't buy happiness. It can't, but it's a tool that can, what you just said, put yourself in situations. I, I paid probably even more to go to the Chautauqua, $3,000. And I was thinking about it the other day because of the people I've met, it was worth like probably fifty dollars to $100,000 to me. Now, if back then, if you would have asked me to pay $100,000 to go to it, I would have said, hell no, but in retrospect, totally worth it. But, but then we go out to eat and my kid orders macaroni and cheese and it's $10 and I'm, uh, <laughs> I am I get pretty upset about that. So, yeah. So you were living in the city, you were starting to cut cost, and then you had a pretty significant move. Can you tell us about the decision-making process and some of the other contexts going on at that time? Yeah. So when I was getting out of this 30 grand of debt, a big motivator for me was that I had this goal to walk the Camino for my 30th birthday. And so I knew that I was going to need to take two months off of work. So that's two months of no income plus funding the trip. Plus I didn't know if my employer was going to let me keep my job. You know, I, I have never had any examples of anyone successfully negotiating or taking a sabbatical. So I wasn't really sure how that was going to all play out. So I felt like, yes, I was excited about pursuing financial independence, but I also had this incredible life experience that I wanted to have with the Camino. And so I felt the need to save as much money as possible to navigate the unknown of that. 
And so that was one piece of it. The other piece of that move was that I, I was going to be away for two months and my landlord wasn't going to let me sublet. And I was living in New York City. Now at this point, I had probably moved like nine times in 10 years. It was like every year I had to move due to rising rent and roommate situations and all of that kind of stuff. And I was just like, well, if I have to move again, I might as well like try something completely different. And I had this friend that I was pretty close to in New York City. She was from Texas, but she went to Cincinnati for school. She met her husband there. She moved to New York City for about five years, and then she ended up moving back to Cincinnati. I visited her like three times in 2016, and I just liked it. It felt like time slowed down, but not that maddening way that New Yorkers hate where there's like no sense of urgency. It wasn't like that. It was like a good slowing down. And... I never I never thought that like a place could make me feel the way that I felt when I visited Cincinnati. And so I just thought why the hell not? You know, I I've got no debt, no man, no kids. I've got the kind of freedom that people dream about and I'm not doing anything with it. You know, I felt this just urge to just try something new. And if I'm wrong, well, then let me be wrong. I'll pick up and move somewhere else. You know, I've, I've just, I've always lived, I grew up in New Jersey. I've always lived in New Jersey and New York. And I've always really admired people that kind of picked up and started their life over in a new city. It was always something really intimidating to me. And so I felt like I had um, an advantage because I had a friend in that city in Cincinnati. So she kind of just dumped me into her social circle. And that definitely helped with the transition. But Cincinnati is like one of the lowest cost of living metro areas in the country. To me, it's like the perfect place to pursue FI because it has everything you'd want out of a big city, but like none of the downsides. Did you have to change jobs? And uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, how big of a shock was that? Because you're going from New York City to Cincinnati. Was it a massive shock to the system? I Maybe, but I would say if it was, it was in a really good way. You know, it wasn't like I showed up and I was just bored. It was like a just a more enjoyable pace of life. It, it was like I didn't realize how burnt out I was in New York until I left. You know, and so I I really enjoyed the transition to Cincinnati. And I was able to convince my employer to allow me to work remotely. So that was another real um, advantage is I took my New York City salary to a much lower cost of living um, city. I, I went from paying $1,800 a month for a cockroach infested apartment in the bowels of Brooklyn <laughs> to a $600 a month mortgage that I house hacked for like, uh, for my first two years, I house hacked my house. And so my, my roommate was paying like 90% of my mortgage when I first bought my house. Um, so yeah, I, I think I was really fortunate in that I was with my employer for about four five years at that time. And I had doubled, I was a salesperson. I had doubled my revenue like two years in a row. So I was really valuable to them. And I remember my boss at the time saying that I was like the queen of culture because I would like, I just loved my team. They felt like family to me. I would like make them play stupid games every Friday. And, you know, I just... I had a lot of fun at work. And so, and I was performing. So I think they really valued me. And when I told them, look, I'm approaching my 30th birthday, let me have my early midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, like let me go walk the Camino and move to the Midwest and just see what happens. And they were really supportive. Cool. And you're still in Cincinnati to this day, correct? Absolutely. Awesome. And do you have any tips for negotiating the? work from home or flexible arrangement. Of course, you were performing, so that's a, maybe a prerequisite, but any other tips? Yeah, I, I think the reason why that worked for me is the relationship that I had with my employer, um, the fact that I was there for a while. Like, I think if I would have asked for that in my first year, it would have been a tough ask because they need to see how valuable you are first. And so like, recognizing the leverage that you have, I think makes you a little bit more confident in negotiating that. 
Um, I also just think like I was able to uh, appeal to their reason. Like even with um, even with the Camino, like taking two months off, I took two months off unpaid. And the way I justified it is I said, look, if I was about to have a baby, I'd be taking three months off. I don't want to birth a child. I want to birth a world adventure, you know, and like, we're both going to be better off. (laughs) So, um, and that, that was a compelling argument to them. You know, I compared it to something that's pretty standard, which is taking maternity leave. I can't believe they didn't try to lower your salary. Was that ever on the the table? Because it seems pretty obvious that that salary would be a lot more uh, in Cincinnati. Yeah. No. And I think it was because I, I was already kind of underpaid. Um, I, you know, so, and I think that I accepted that because of the, they were giving me big jumps at that time. I think I got like two or three 20% raises like three years in a row because they were like trying to get me to the level that I should have been at based on what I was delivering. Um, but I think because I was underpaid for years before that, um, it just wasn't really on the table. They didn't bring it up. I didn't bring it up. Maybe I just got lucky in that sense. And then did you have any challenges, uh, maybe not socially, you seem pretty outgoing, moving to the new city, any things you were surprised about or unexpected things going on? Hmm. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately that the working from home now that I've been doing it for four years, I am a very extroverted person. And I think I, I think it has weighed on me over time, the being by myself over time, you know, I, I've kind of built up habits and um, self-care and things for my mental health that I, I definitely think help. But I do see that, you know, being by myself most of the time, especially with COVID, it's it weighs on you. I find I drink earlier in the day, but yeah. it's not necessarily a con <laughs> overall. Yeah, Diane, I God, I could go in so many different directions here, and I'm famous in these podcasts for going off course. But today, Doug, Doug's going to roll his eyes and slap me. <laughs> I'm going to stay the course, but maybe this weekend or maybe in a future recording with you, I'd like to talk to you more about what you just said. But one thing with COVID, yeah, I don't consider myself to be an extreme extrovert. I'm pretty introverted. And before COVID, I thought, you know, I'm okay to just sit around all day and just uh, play with my, no, that sounds, play with myself, (laughs) work, work by myself. Uh, (laughs) But then during COVID, I'm like, oh my God, I, I realized probably halfway through, this is weighing on me too. I need to, even if I'm not actually interacting with people. I just need to be around other humans and our co-working space. I'll yeah. with that. The one or two people who showed up during COVID. But yeah, the, the struggle is real. And I can't imagine what someone like you would go through if someone like me struggled. So, let's- Well, you know, I actually just thought I needed to marinate on your question for a minute about challenges. One thing I did not anticipate when I moved here, the dating pool is very different. And because it's a smaller city, I didn't realize like you could go out with someone and like, you'll see them the next day in the grocery store, <laughs> you know, like in New York, you just date around and like, you, you'll you never see that person again. It's like very unlikely. And yeah, so I did not really anticipate that in a okay. smaller city, like the challenges that would come with dating. It worked out. I mean, I've now been with my boyfriend for three years, but yeah, it was, it was a learning curve in the beginning. Got it. Well, and I'll take us on a tangent. This sounds interesting. Carl and I are married and not, we're not, older, not to each other. So, yeah, yeah. We're married, <laughs> not to each other. Not, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. We're whatever you want to do. It's not, not where I was going exactly. But there's apps now. So, Carl and I have not experienced apps. And if you've been mm-hmm. with your boyfriend for three years, uh, I guess. There were apps, but uh, yeah, t- tell us about it. H- how is that like? What tips can you give Carl and I? Oh, yeah. Well, we met on an app. We met on Bumble. We both swiped right. And uh, there's it's so exhausting 
I find the apps really exhausting. I had like a love hate relationship with them. There's something like exciting about it where you're like, oh, but the next swipe is going to be a good one. Like you're just like constantly waiting for like that next one could be good. Um, and it is exciting to meet new people. Um, but I did find it exhausting at times. Like, you know, you get your hopes up and then the, you don't click. I think the thing I realized is there's so much more that goes into like being attracted to someone than just seeing their picture, right? You like, you need to make a decision about someone based on like a few lines of text and a picture. Whereas I think most of attraction is like the sound of someone's voice, the way they move, the, their mannerisms, like their energy, right? And you just, it's really hard to get exposed to that when you're just looking at these apps. And so one thing I started doing at the ends that I think worked really well, it was a great litmus test. I immediately would ask someone to talk to me on the phone. And I would say 90% of the people were like really scared of that, right? Like they, they would just completely ghost me. As soon as I asked to talk on the phone, they were like, bye. And that was actually a really, it really, it did a nice job of like kind of narrowing it down to the, like, if you're not willing to talk to me on the phone, I'm sorry, but like, I don't want to waste time going to like meet up with you and then be disappointed that there was no chemistry. So yeah, I, it's funny. Like my, my boyfriend now, I asked him, I think we maybe had two exchanges over the app. And then I was like, can we just talk on the phone? And he was like, yes. You know, and, yeah. and then that was it. Interesting. So I lied before. I am going to hijack this and go off on another <laughs> tangent. But I blame Doug because he went off on a tangent. When in your conversation, when in your dating did you talk about money and did you need to talk about it? We had a podcast recording a couple weeks ago with Mindy. And with us, the strange thing was we never talked about money, but there were clues there that we didn't really need to. We knew we were both frugal. I used coupons. She had a, we both had shitty cars. Did you talk about money? Where did that come into the mm. whole? Have you talked about money yet? Three years into it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, we've definitely talked about it now. Um, I think it probably came up really early on just because the fire movement is a real interest of mine. Um, so, you know, naturally when you're dating, you're going to talk about what you're interested in. And so I think that's probably how it initially came up. Um, I think it was refreshing for him because he's really frugal. And so he just really liked that. I think the thing he really liked about it is that I'm not very materialistic and I don't really care about a fancy car and like luxuries and expensive things. And I think he really, really liked that. That's awesome. It's such a, I'm so thankful. One of the things I'm most fa thankful for in life is that I found someone who has values just like that. Similar, they don't give a shit about clothes and cars and all that crap. So it's yeah. such a, uh, so you valuable. Wear stuff like that. All yeah, I can wear junk at this <laughs> stupid thing. I, I, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, pretty. maybe we'll have a clothing exchange at the uh, at the uh, Camp of High this week. And are any clothes off limit? Like, like un <laughs> un underwear, but nice ones, like no stains. Like, Doug, Doug, would you trade underwear with me if we have a Mimosa clothing exchange at Camp of High this weekend? <laughs> I'm, I'm not as frugal as you, but yes, I will. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's, I think we're probably about the same size. Yeah, yeah, probably done. You heard it here first. So, so Diane, bring your stuff. I don't. Maybe Mindy has some shit she wanted. She wants to trade with you. Well, that went off course a little bit, but I think we can reel <laughs> reel it back in. Yeah, El, El Camino. Anything else uh, Cincinnati wise that's that's interesting? Any any plug for the city, uh, perhaps? I just love Cincinnati so much. I, you can get anywhere in like twenty minutes. You know, it's traffic isn't that bad. There's great restaurants. There's a lot of art. There's a lot of things to do. Um, I I enjoy the hiking around here. I do I do long distance hiking like every weekend, and there's lots of different places to go. Um, yeah, I just I I say you'd have to see it for yourself. You know, there's this, um, you know, there's the Ohio River. There's downtown. There's like this waterfront park that I like to walk at a lot. Um, yeah, just come check it out. See for yourself. That, that's awesome. So I'm coming into Cincinnati for Economy. And you just convinced me. I wrote a note here to book my, not only book my ticket finally, but book it a couple of days early to come fart around C Cincinnati for a bit. I like seeing new places. So, And before we get back on topic, 
Does Cincinnati have, uh, it's one of those signature dishes, and I want to say it's like chili on spaghetti. Is that right? Oh, Skyline. Don't even get me started. Um, yeah, the locals love Skyline, and I'm sorry for anyone listening to this. Um, actually, funny story about my first date with my boyfriend. Um, he like Ubered where we were going, and I drove, so I offered to drive him home um, at the end of the date. And we were, we passed this billboard for Skyline, and I just mentioned like, oh, I've never had Skyline. Like everyone tells me to like that you need to like eat it for the first time when you're like drunk and finishing up the night. It's the only way that <laughs> an out of toner would like it, I guess, if you're drunk. And uh, I wasn't drunk at the time, but it was the end of the night, and and it was just this spontaneous like let's do this right now. Like there's a skyline on, you know, on our way to drop me off. So like, let's have skyline. Um, it was my first and last time ever having skyline. And I like watched this man house this disgusting spaghetti with, <laughs> like, with this chili on it. And it's very um, heavy cinnamon flavor. I think the thing that I found most offensive about it as an Italian is that it was very clear that they didn't salt the pasta water. And I just, I couldn't get past that. So not only do you have to be drunk to enjoy it, but I think I, like you're talking about spaghetti, uh, chili and cinnamon. I think a drunk person actually invented this concoction, right? <laughs> that sounds right. That sounds right. All the leftovers. Oh, we have some pasta noodles. Yeah. Fucking throw it, throw it in. It'll be fine. So let's talk about, let's finally get to our next topic, the El Camino. And whenever I hear that term, I don't even, I'm studying Spanish. I don't know what that means. But when I hear it, I think of that weird pickup truck car from the 70s or whenever that thing was. So tell me what your... El Camino is and and uh, what that means in Spanish, if you know, because I don't. El Camino. Um, I thought it meant the way, the way of St. James. Um, historically, it's a uh, Catholic pilgrimage. So back in like medieval times, people did this for penance. Um, and now there are like different trails that you follow. There's like a path that you follow. Um, but like back in the day, people would walk outside their door. Like they would start their Camino by walking outside their door and just like walking across many countries to get to Santiago, which is said to have um, the remains of St. James. So for me, the Camino was something that was put on my radar by my aunt. Um, I have a very adventurous aunt that I always looked up to my whole life. And she did the Camino in her 40s and just thought that it was something that I would like to do. So she mentioned it to me kind of like in my early 20s. And then maybe a couple years later, she mentioned that she was going to do it again. And she wanted to do it with her husband, my uncle, for his 70th birthday. They were going to walk 500 miles across a country for his 70th birthday. And I was just like, Psh. like, I thought that was insane. I was worried about their safety and well being. So my initial motivation was like, I got to go just to like help them. And I'm going to like chaperone this trip for my elderly uncle. That That's kind of what I thought I was going to do. And, and then like a few years go by and I remember having a conversation with my aunt where I said, like, what was that thing that we were going to do? And when is that happening? And she kind of like thought about it. And she said, oh, well, Uncle Salvatore is turning 70 in 2017. And this was around the time that I had started thinking about my debt and realized like, oh, that's two years away. I got to get my stuff in order if I'm actually going to do this. And so that kind of set me on the whole path of getting out of debt and all of that. But I changed my whole life around to go do this crazy thing that I thought I was doing to support someone else. And then like three months before the trip, they said they couldn't go. And I think it actually was really, really good for me to go do it alone. Um, because it, it went from me doing it to support someone else to something that I actually wanted to do for myself and a way that I wanted to push myself outside my comfort zone and challenge myself. And, you know, Carl, I know we talked about this, the I can do hard shit. 
I think that thought really originated in my mind through the process of getting out of debt. Most people think that's a really hard thing to do to get out of 30 grand of debt in 11 months, which in some ways it was hard, but in a lot of ways it was very easy. And it gave me this sense of like, oh, I can do hard things. What else is hard that I can do? What else feels impossible at first glance that I could actually do? And the Camino became like the outlet for that. And I think when it comes to how hard it was, it really surprised me that it wasn't hard in the ways that I thought it was going to be hard. So the thing I was worried about most was like my physical capacity to do it. I wouldn't say I was ever a very athletic person. I wasn't a big hiker. You know, I... I, I was very insecure about physically being able to walk 500 miles, even though that I'm, I'm young and I'm relatively healthy. So I did a lot of training. I did a ton of research on like what to pack. I wasn't an exper- I've never camped before. I would never like, I, did, I needed all this stuff and I didn't have a lot of knowledge around it. So a lot of my preparation was like obsessively reading about it, coming up with lists of what I should pack. Anytime I would talk to anyone, I would tell them I'm doing the Camino. And it was like nine times out of 10, they know someone who's done it. So then I was getting introduced to people who had done it. I think I had about 20 people review my packing list before I went and like debate every single item on this list. So a lot of my preparation was for what I thought the most challenging thing would be, the physical part of it. And that part of it was not the biggest challenge. Sure, it was hard. Like I had to deal with blisters and, you know, physically it's a really hard thing to do. I was walking between 10 and 20 miles a day. But it's amazing how quickly your body acclimates to that. You really do like just get into a flow and your body just goes and it just becomes your new normal. The thing I wasn't prepared for was like the emotional side of things. The being confronted with a lot of my own insecurities, a lot of my own issues that were kind of below the surface, that without the kind of everyday life of going to work and paying bills and kind of your day-to-day, when all of that's stripped away and all you have is a pretty simple existence where the only thing you have to do that day is walk from one town to the next and find food and find a place to sleep, that opens up a lot of bandwidth to like deal with your shit. And so like a great example I like to say is if you were driving to work and someone cut you off on the road, you'd be pissed for like a second, but then you get to the office and you got emails to deal with and you got phone calls to do. It's like life comes in and it all gets swept away. But when you're on the Camino and someone pisses you off in the morning because they're being inconsiderate as we're all getting ready to like walk our 10, 20 miles that day, then you just walk in silence, thinking about it the entire time. <laughs> I mean, it's maddening. It's it, it can be maddening. And I don't know. I just felt like the Camino is like one of the most intense forms of therapy. Because a lot of times you think that you're going to be dealing with your issues kind of... You know you're taking space. You know for a lot of people, this is a spiritual journey. You're kind of going into it wanting that. But the Camino like confronts you in really weird ways. So like, for example, you know, I talked about dating and I had been single for a long time before, probably like over four years by the time I walked to the Camino. And so I thought this is a great opportunity for me to like be by myself and analyze my issues with men. Right. And the Camino was like, no, 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 let's watch this play out in real time. And on the first day I met an Australian man and like totally fell for him and proceeded to chase him across the country. (laughs) Right. And so that's what I mean. And like, like that was the like most challenging part of the Camino for me. It was this Australian man who was like breaking my heart, you know, and I, there was no way I could have prepared for that. So it was just, it was challenging in ways that I would have never expected. Wow. And how long did it take you to walk? It took me 38 days to get to Santiago to walk those 500 miles. And I did a little bit more like Santiago is kind of seen as the finish line because that's like with 
if you're Catholic, if you're doing it for penance and for religious reasons, that's kind of the finish line. For me, it was a lot more meaningful to like get to the coast. So there are two coastal towns, Finisterre and Mushia, um, where you can kind of keep going. And that was really meaningful to me to, it adds like another like three days, um, probably to your, to your timeline. But to be able to say like I walked from you know the south of France all the way to the other side of Spain was right very meaningful for me. Wow, and and this is a backpacking style. I'm not familiar with the trail, so you camped every night basically, and maybe you had or go ahead. No, what, what's it like? So it's it's not like the Appalachian Trail where you're like carrying everything and you're carrying all of your food. You're basically walking to the next medieval town. And everyone stays in bas- basically hostels. It's like a sea of bunk beds, and you know, it's like five euro a night to stay there. Um, in most of these really small towns, so yeah, I I would I thought I was going to do the Appalachian Trail when I got back, and then I read about it, and I was like, oh no, I felt very. I mean, in in so many ways, it's it's still a very challenging thing to do. But I got a shower every night. That was like the best part of the day. You know, I got a bed to sleep in. It may have been filled with bed bugs, but I still had a bed to sleep in. <laughs> you know? I was just thinking, yeah, there must have been a lot of turnover in the hostels and just random people from all over the world going through. Definitely. But the people that you meet is, to me, the most powerful part. Because I just think the Camino attracts a certain kind of person that maybe just has a level of depth to them that I really appreciated. So like nobody asked me what I did for work when I was walking the Camino because it didn't matter what I did for work. What mattered was like, like they wanted to know why I was doing it or, you know, what I was getting out of it. Who was I meeting? How was I managing? Like there's just this instant sense of camaraderie when it comes to the other that we call ourselves pilgrims, you know, when you're walk, it's a pilgrimage. Um, and there's just this instant sense of camaraderie that we're all doing this really hard thing together. And there was a lot of trust between people. I never once felt unsafe. You know, when we would stop to eat lunch, everyone like would just drop their bag and it would just be a pile of bags and no one ever worried about someone else stealing from them. It was, it was actually really, really nice. Was there anything that you wish you had that you decided not to bring or didn't think about? Oh, it's funny you ask that because I was just talking to someone the other day who was preparing to go on the Camino and I read them my whole list of like what I wish I had, what I brought and I didn't need. Um, The number one thing I tell people is lamb's wool. This was something I discovered while on the trail, but it's... You know, a lot of people will use toe socks to prevent blisters between your toes, but lamb's wool worked really well for me um, because it feels like walking on clouds. You weave it between your toes. It it does a lot for moisture, but it doesn't create a lot of pressure because it's not as bulky as maybe toe socks and you can't buy it anywhere. So I met this like Englishman that had a big bag of it. And anytime I'd see him, I'd like beg him for lamb's wool. <laughs> you know, he had, he had the goods and he couldn't really get that anywhere else. So yeah, if I had to name one thing, lamb's wool, 100%. Okay. And it's a, is it like, uh, not lamb's wool socks, but like loose lamb's wool? Yeah, it's like loose. It, it's almost like a cotton ball. You know, you stretch it out and then you kind of weave it in between your toes. How about that? I never heard of that. Have you? Nope. Huh. And then do you just use it for the one day or do you somehow wash it? I would would reuse it. I would reuse it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can wash it out and dry it out. Okay. Crazy. Okay. So, so Doug, we talked about doing the clothing exchange at Campify, and I would do that. I would exchange my underwear at Campify, but... (laughs) That bed bug, bed bug comment, there's no way I'm doing a clothing exchange, especially underwear on the El Camino, unless it's new lamb's wool that an Englishman or perhaps an attractive Australian man would offer me. But <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like you learned a lot about yourself with the whole, uh, and I can relate to this because when I quit all these issues that were in my background that I were, again, pushed down because of the busyness of day-to-day life surfaced and became a bit of an asshole and argued with my wife. And I've since course corrected and become not as much of an asshole. I probably still am, but less of an asshole. What did you learn about yourself and what did you change as a result of Mm. your experience on the Camino? 
You know, I thought that Camino was going to be like this fix, right? Like I would solve all of my issues on the Camino. And I think the way it worked out is I it, it helped me identify them. And I think I'll spend the rest of my life working on them. <laughs> you know, I know we'll talk about the economy conference, but I like to say that my the Camino helped me identify where my demons are and economy is helping me go to battle with them, it feels like. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me is like recognizing how how much I don't have a strong internal compass sometimes, right? Like I'm very influenced by other people's opinions and like what other people say. And I, I've needed to like almost tap into like be more rooted in myself and have my own opinions and trust my own guidance, right? So like, for example, I remember talking to people on the trail of like, hey, you know, I'm going to get to Santiago. I think I might go to Finisterre and Mashia. And then I've got, I'm going to get a ticket and go to Madrid and spend some time in Madrid before I go home because my flight's out of Madrid. And people will go, oh no, you got to go to Porto or no, 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 you should do this or you should do that. And, and then I'd walk with that and think, they'd had me questioning and doubting myself. I had decided I wanted to do something. And then these external forces of people that I don't even know that well were really having me question myself. Or like, for example, this guy that I was all hung up on, um, I, I ended up getting a tattoo. No, ooh, there we go. Yeah. If you could see it. So this, this arrow tattoo, I, you know, I'm inverted. So it's like hard for me to like, figure out. <laughs> So the the arrow was a really meaningful symbol for me on the trail because the whole way is marked by arrows. So every time you'd see an arrow, you'd be like, oh, I'm not lost. You know, like it's a very it became a very comforting symbol for me. And so I decided that I wanted to commemorate this trip by getting an arrow tattoo when I reached Santiago. But this guy that I was obsessed with didn't like tattoos. And I remember that influencing me. I remember questioning myself, like, maybe I shouldn't get this tattoo. Like, that is crazy. I really wanted it. I, I spent, I remember probably two weeks, like, writing in my journal about all the reasons why I wanted the tattoo and what the meaning of it was for me and what it represented for me. And I put a lot of thought into it. And I, when I would meet new people and we'd talk about, you know, what we were going to do when we got to Santiago, I would read them my list of reasons why I wanted this tattoo and they would add to them. And like just thinking about going through that whole process and then from someone's passing comment to decide that maybe I would let that go, it just really made me realize like how much I need to just be more rooted in myself and not be so easily swayed by other people's opinions. Yeah, so much value to that. Have you ever read? I bring this up in the uh, our recordings off, and there's uh, Tim Urban, the Wait But Why blog called. I think it's called Taming the Inner, Inner Mammoth, Becoming the Real You, or something like that. Have you ever heard of that before? I haven't. Oh, it's really good. It's it's the most important thing I've ever read in my entire life. And the whole point of it is kind of what you just said. You need to be your own authentic, real person. And I think about this a, a lot often because there's people pleaser type of people like wishy-washy who will just go along with, with whatever other people do. And I, I don't know. I don't want to sound like an asshole. I just told you I'm an asshole. So I guess I can be one. I guess those are the most ineffective type of people or maybe the least respected because no one – people respect and they – like that's Mr. Money Mustache's appeal. He's a strong leader. He's going to tell you this is how it is and that's it this is how it's going to be done. And those are the people who change the world. It's not the people who are like, oh, I'll do whatever you want to do. Uh, on the other hand, you have to be able to, when knowledge comes about that should change your point of view, you have to be receptive to it. You can't be a total asshole and be right. receptive but to I, any opinion. It's like, it, I think it takes a lot of discernment to be able to listen to yourself, listen to the input of other people, value that, right? I mean, other people, to me, I mean, as an extrovert, that's the spice of life, right, is other people. And when I think about the ideas that I get the most excited about, it's because other people exposed me to them. 
but I have to latch onto them in my own unique way. And I need to kind of reprocess them into um, something that's unique to me and not just like being overly influenced by other people. But I think that takes a lot of work to be able to kind of like slow down and get quiet and question, is this something that I really want or am I being overly influenced by external forces? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, (laughs) I used to say yes to everything. And uh, a a bunch of people have written about this, the value of saying no. And I think that's part of it. Is this really part of my inner scorecard, what this person is is suggesting? Or am I just excited about it because I think this other person or other people will be excited about it? So yeah, it's all part of figuring yourself out. I I really like the comment you said about the El Camino. It, It didn't solve your problems, but it it made you realize what they were. What's the old G.I. Joe thing? Knowing is half the battle. Do you remember that from Cartoons, Doug? Or do you remember that, Diane? Okay. No, I wasn't too into G.I. Joe. <laughs> oh, man. They no, they used to have these cartoons, and it was like a public service announcement to try to teach these kids lessons. And I don't remember what that one was. Maybe the kid was being a, a dick. and so, <laughs> so Someone told him how to be. And the, uh, the main lesson was knowing is half the battle. And I think that's true because we all have stuff to work on, but how many people – know or will admit or acknowledge the things they have to work on to become a a better person, to become a better version of yourself. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing that stands out about the Camino and kind of how it relates to my path to Phi, you know, the goal is to walk these 500 miles. And so in essence, I've achieved the goal. I walked the Camino, but a part of me also feels like I failed the goal because I didn't, I don't think I had the full breadth of experience that I could have had on that trip because I was so distracted by this guy. You know, I, <laughs> I read my journals. Um, I journaled a ton while I was on the Camino. And it makes me sad to reread those journals and see that like 70% about, of it was about this dude. Like, I I had an incredible opportunity and life experience and I still got a lot out of it. But I almost feel like I I'm doing it again. First of all, I'm going to do it for my 40th birthday. And I it's like I want to try again with this knowledge of not being so distracted by other people and just being be approaching it like a little being a little bit more present for the experience as it's unfolding versus getting distracted by something that maybe is less important than the experience right in front of me, but also like not holding on to the goal so tightly. I think there is approach an approach to challenges and goal setting where you're approaching your goals sincerely, but not so seriously, right? It's like there's this this kind of hustle culture that I think I'm very influenced by where you think you've got to push and you think you've got to like achieve. And that's where the benefit is, is in reaching the goal. But I think we don't talk enough about how important it is to un- enjoy the unfolding and to pay attention to how it's unfolding versus just being so like laser focused on reaching this this goal that you just made up. Yeah. The journey is, I think most of the value in a lot of these pursuits come from the the journey and the things you learn there. But I, I have one more follow-up question. You mentioned that as you, your first uh, attempt at stand-up comedy, you read your 12-year-old Winnie the Pooh uh, journal in front of an audience. <laughs> now I'm thinking you just said you journaled and I, I suspect there's a lot, there, there might be, Parts in there about Mr. Crikey. What's an Australian term? Mr. Down Under. I don't know. If if you read that now, would you consider it? Would you be sad or could that be turned into a comedic piece? It right. probably could be. It probably could be. I mean, I think when it when it comes back to like when it comes to looking back on that kind of stuff, time is heals a lot, right? Like when it's a fresh wound, maybe it's a little hard to read it. But when you've got the space of years to look back on it, it it just it doesn't sting as much and you can kind of I think reflect on it a little differently. So it sounds like you've been journaling uh for most of your life. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the value and why you continue to journal and 
maybe some of your practice now? Mm. Um, I usually journal every morning. Um, and a lot of it is just maybe unraveling my crazy. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's me venting, but a lot of times the venting will turn into like me hyping myself up and like reminding myself of, you know, the, the things that I value and the importance of how of my energy and how I approach my day and not just what I get done on my to-do list. I'm, I'm a pretty type A. So it's like, I want to check everything off the list. And I'm, and I'm trying to prioritize that the way I approach those things is more important than actually getting them done. You know, am I, Am I being fully present? Am I enjoying what I'm creating? Am I connecting with other people? You know, I, I think I need a reminder of that every morning before I approach my day. So a lot of it is like just kind of planning out the day, venting a little bit and hyping myself up and reminding myself of, of you know, what life's all about, honestly. Do you have any other practices like that? Uh, it's common for people to say meditation. Uh, do you have any other practices that you do on a daily or regular basis to help you out? Yeah. I went through a long period of time um, just this past year after reading this book, The Miracle Morning. I don't know if you guys know that book, but um, I am like an extreme morning person. When I'm feeling balanced and healthy and I'm taking good care of myself, like my body wants to jump out of bed at 5 a.m. It's a little obnoxious. <laughs> and um, so I would start my day with, um, and I go through periods where I kind of fall out of this, but, you know, journaling, reading, um, meditation, uh, affirmations, some exercise, and like eating a breakfast and then starting work. That like, I've gone through long periods of time where it would take me like three hours to get through all of that in the morning. And it just felt very luxurious, you know, that I'm like spending this time with myself and prioritizing this level of self care um, before I do anything else. Awesome. Ready to move on to the next section? Yeah, I do think so. I appreciate the conversation about the Camino. That's, uh, I've always wanted to do a long hike, I've considered the AT. Uh, the PCT, but I, I think the Camino would be a great warm up and a great way to see if you really might like any of those other two. So I'm going to actually talk to Mindy about it when I get home. When do you turn 40? When is the next El Camino expedition without Mr. So, um, Australia, hopefully? <laughs> so it will be uh, 2027. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a little bit of time to prepare for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's move on. All right. So I have a note here about quitting work recently. Yeah. So can you tell us about that whole story? Absolutely. So I, you know, I set this up earlier by talking about how great my employer was, which they really were. I was with the company for nine years total. And during that time, I had doubled my salary. Um, I really felt like my company really that my employer really valued me. They gave me this time off. They let me move to Cincinnati. Um, I always had really great bosses. The thing is that this company changed so much in the time that I was there. So it originated as like a female owned company. We had about five offices around the world, all run by women. Um, and then the company was sold um, to a much larger company. So we were acquired. Then we were spun off. Sorry about that. Um, we were acquired. We were spun off. We were joint ventured. We basically we were we we were owned by this company that grew through acquisition. It's a lot of like moving around paper, right? And it was cool to be able to survive and thrive in that dynamic. But what ultimately happened is the the culture of the company really diminished because of all of those changes. And I ended up getting a new boss about a year ago who was like good friends with the CEO. And this person was brought in on the sales team to be a leader not in so much managing people, but he was supposed to like get the big deals done, like show us how it's going to be done. Right. And then he never did one deal and he was promoted to chief revenue officer. 
I've done 80 deals. And now there's this person who never did one deal that's like managing me. And that was really a challenge. Um, it was really a challenge for me. I, it's, it sounds like shitty for me to call him incompetent, but I can't really find another word. And I feel like a lot of people can resonate with that. A lot of people have dealt with having an incompetent boss. I just never have. This was my first real experience with that. And I think I didn't recognize um, the pitfalls of that and how damaging that could be to my career um, to work for someone that's not really qualified for the position. So basically where things started to fall apart is when Black Lives Matter started, a lot of companies had diversity and inclusiveness initiatives. And it really kind of opened up a can of worms for me because I realized that I was the only woman on my team. And that slowly happened all the time, like over time. All of the women in the organization seemed to be fleeing very quietly. And it just, I kind of realized like, wait, I'm the only woman on my team right now. Um, I was also one of the higher performers, but I was the lowest paid on the team. And so when they opened up this conversation about diversity and inclusiveness, and we're in all these meetings talking about how we feel about it. And I said, well, I guess I'll speak up as the only woman on the team and like how I feel about it. And I basically said to my boss, like, when you're talking about diversity and inclusiveness, you're really talking about equality. And I think if you guys really want to do something about this, you should look at pay parity and you should look at you know, how you're promoting people and how you're compensating people. And I think where I went wrong in this process is I moved away in 2017 and, you know, experienced these great raises three years in a row and these great privileges. But does that mean that I never signed up to get a raise ever again? <laughs> like I didn't get a raise in three years after that. And I didn't ask for it because I was just so grateful for how I had been treated before that. So part of it, I think, was on me. And then part of it, I think, was the changing culture of the company. But it just became very clear to me in those conversations with my new boss that I was being held to a much higher standard than my male colleagues. And he had an inability to be really clear about around expectations. And like, I'm a salesperson. I should have a, a number I need to hit. He wasn't able to communicate that. He was only able to say, you're just not doing enough. But he would never tell me what enough was. So it was just this kind of like impossible um, situation. I definitely feel like I hit a glass ceiling. I had talked to you know acquaintances at probably our six biggest competitors and realized how underpaid I was and brought that information to my boss um, as a part of this negotiation. And he just said no, that I, he didn't feel I was entitled to any kind of raise. And I found that really surprising. But I think the nail in the coffin for me was one of my male colleagues um, got promoted to VP. And we can all see each other's numbers. And when I saw that he delivered half as much as me in the fiscal year that was being evaluated, it just kind of felt like, wow, like this is really, really clear that... Um, it's a dynamic that I don't feel I should put up with, honestly. And I could have fought and I could have, you know, done all of that. But I just felt that it was a push. It was a push for me to leave. Like, it was almost like the party's over. This, this career and this job has served me very well for a very long time. But the party's over. And when I looked at my money situation, I'm not financially independent. But I feel like I had enough money to not have to put up with a situation like this. And I had talked to probably about 10 women that also worked for this company, five who had already left and five who were still there. And the five that already left, left for the same reason. And they never said anything about it. And then the five that were still there wanted to leave for the same reason, but weren't in a financial position to do so. And I just felt like... I'm in this really privileged position to not only leave, but to also make a big stink about it on the way out. So I did write them a letter and I described the discrimination in excruciating detail. Um, 
And, you know, they said they would look into it, but they never pushed back. They never said, no, 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 that's not the reason why you're not getting a raise. Here are all the legitimate reasons why we made this decision. There was never any response. So I guess I'm a little all over the place in describing this situation, but um, I felt very strongly that it was discrimination. And it's really hard for me to tell that story because I've never felt disadvantaged for being a woman ever in my life. I mean, my mom was the breadwinner growing up in school. All the girls were the smart ones that got the best grades. I went to college on a full academic scholarship and then I've always worked for women. Like I've just never really found myself in a scenario like this before. And it was hard for me, I think, to accept that that, you know, it was discrimination and I need to decide what I'm going to do about it. Wow. That sucks. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, so I, I think in most cases in life, whenever you can, you should make decisions based on data and numbers because numbers don't lie. And here you are doing 80 deals and the guy promoted to chief revenue officer or whatever done did zero, especially for a salesperson. There's not a lot of jobs. Yeah. There's some gray area in there because it's subjective, but that it's strictly numbers. You did more deals than anyone else. You should be the chief revenue officer or have some other promotion. That's a, that's a bunch of shit. And how long did that story take place? I guess, when did you quit? I'm just curious yeah. like, how much time so, elapsed. So basically in November of last year is when I kind of made, I made the case. Like I did all the research. I pulled all my numbers. I made my pitch for, I deserve a raise. And then I, on December 15th, I was told, yeah, that's great, but no. (laughs) And then exactly one month later I quit. I think over that month, it was just, it was really challenging for me to like, process all of it, to weigh the pros and cons, to figure out what I was going to do. You know, I thought that, well, I need to find another job. And even though I wasn't looking for another job when I went to those six competitors, like a couple of offers came out of that. So I had to evaluate, was I going to jump ship for a competitor? I kind of like thought that those, that that would be my ticket out. But what I was offered wasn't ideal for a lot of different reasons that I won't bore you with. Um, And so I think what was really empowering for me is to look at my finances and see that I don't need a ticket out from someone else. I'm my own ticket out. And I think that's what we all want when we're striving for FI. It's just I... I think I made that decision before reaching FI. I looked at my money and I said, I've got fuck you money, which I define as one to two years of living expenses liquid. So I have a year in cash and I have another year in an after-tax brokerage. And then I've reached coast FI status. So I don't have to worry as much about saving for traditional retirement. And then I also had, you know, a couple of side projects that I feel have a lot of potential. So it's not like I was like leaving and I didn't have anything else to do. I still have a lot of work to do. It just it, it doesn't necessarily generate income for me. So, but it it does in a sense help manage risk. So like the podcast that I host covers about a third of my monthly expenses. Um, And then economy is very much in the red, but has a lot of potential because we've doubled revenue from last year. So it's on this trajectory that feels very promising for me to at least not continue to lose money on it. So I felt with those two things and then just kind of being open to taking some time off and not like derailing my plans to reach FI, but almost allowing myself to be a little uncertain on what the trajectory is. Because I could, as pursuing self-employment, let's say, I could potentially make more money than I had put into my calculations to reach FI by 40. Or I could make less and it could take me longer time to get there. But it's almost like I feel like I bought myself the opportunity to take that risk and to like step into the unknown and just see what happens, honestly. Um, 
and, and walk away from a situation that was no longer serving me. And about how long did it uh, delay Phi? So now it, you're aiming for 40. What was it yeah. before if you were on the same trajectory? Yeah, it was reaching five by 40 was like the current trajectory if I would have kept my job. And now I really don't know. Okay. Um, so you know what's interesting about it? Like I ran all the numbers, made, you know, made some assumptions, looked, I'm very clear on what my monthly expenses are, yearly expenses, all of that. So I come up with a budget and I basically said, I'm going to take off of work for a year and like kind of see what happens, see what opportunities present themselves. But then I ended up getting like a windfall of um, some money from a tax return that I didn't really uh, incorporate into my calculations. So today, you know, we're going into July. Um, I left my job uh, January 29th was my last day. I have more money today than when I left. Like my um, my burn rate is just like not nearly as fast as I anticipated it would be. So maybe I'm just getting lucky, but it's working out as of now. And like honestly, what is the worst case scenario? I just go get another job. Right. Yep. You know. So it's it's risky in some senses, but I think. Staying at an employer that was disrespecting me is a bigger risk than I think what I'm doing now. Like I, I definitely have no regrets. It is hard to walk away from a six-figure salary. It is really hard, especially when you did not plan to do that. Um, but life is going to throw things at you. And I think having the financial bandwidth to navigate that is one of the strengths of pursuing FI. I didn't anticipate that this was going to happen, but... It's it's really thrilling to see how it's unfolding. Yeah, I think uh, FI is misunderstood and people rebel against it because whenever you see a story on Market Watch or a media site, they show like some young couple in a camper van on the Mexican Riviera or some similar thing. But what's not understood or maybe what's not appreciated is I think the the primary, the most the best value is to its protection. It's an insurance policy in case someone gets sick or your bosses turn out to be a pack of assholes so you can help out with the former situation or bail on the on the shitty situation your your crappy job uh, and a- another thing I think is you said you don't know when you're going to be financially independent but t- to me the whole point of financial independence is to provide more meaning for your life you might not be, be getting that from your job so it's to live a more meaningful intentional life and you're not financially independent yet but what you've done so far is allowing you to do that now. So fuck it. I think you did the yeah. right thing. You're going to have, I think you'll look back and maybe you already have. I'm curious. That's probably my follow-up question. I know it's pretty recent, only six months for you, but I think you're going to, if not already, you're going to look back at this and say, those assholes who I work for who made me quit, that was probably one of the best things that happened to me. I think so. And you know, this situation is really challenging for me to talk about sometimes because it really made me doubt myself. Like, am I not as good as I think I am? Do I did I not really not deserve that raise? You know, I I really am so thankful for my support system that spent hours upon hours upon hours on the phone with me, like analyzing the situation and and making me feel like more comfortable about my decision and that I was looking at it for, from all angles. Um, but I was really surprised on like when I kind of announced this, that I'm leaving my job, that I'm leveraging my fuck you money. I got so many notes from people that were saying like, I'm in such a similar situation to you, but I'm three years from Phi. I just need to like hold on a little bit longer until I reach it. And I just, I'm so blown away by that because I I can understand the sentiment. I did I did definitely see a scenario where I could just put my head down for six more years and then I'd be free. But life is short, right? And not that we're being irresponsible, but you a lot of us on this path have a level of financial bandwidth that's pretty incredible. And it's not that you don't have to work anymore, but maybe you just don't have to work someplace that makes you miserable. 
you know, um, I don't know. I think that more people would benefit from like really questioning if you're miserable on your path to fire, or you're working someplace that it's clearly time to go, you know, is it, are you really derailing your plans by exploring full autonomy over your time now versus when you reach five, right? Because isn't that what we're all striving for? It's autonomy over our time. That's what we really want. And I think that you can get that sooner um, by experimenting with some of the bandwidth that that you've built up financially. Yeah. Um, just running some numbers very quickly in my head. Let's go through a scenario. Let's say you're your goal is a million dollars and you have you hate your life, you've, you're in a toxic situation, but you've only raised like $800,000 so far. So you're going to have to live on 32000 instead of 40000 or you're going to have to make 8000 a year. Like how many of us, especially if we're young, really think we're not going to make another cent? You could just put some – I was talking to someone yesterday. They started putting some ridiculous thing on Etsy and now they make like $1,000 a month and they created one thing one time. It, it's it, like the worst case scenario, you said, Diana, just if it really goes down the, the shithole, just go back to work. It's not, it's not that bad. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. I've heard you say that pursuing FI can be a personal or a journey of personal development. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, I think the way that's playing out for me is just in the beginning, when I first discovered this, the questions I was asking myself are, how do I decrease my expenses and increase my income? The question was about my savings rate. How do I increase that savings rate and like reach five faster? And I think at a certain point, we need to move beyond that. And we need to start asking bigger questions like, what do I want to create? How do I want to spend my time? Who do I want to spend that time with? Those are the bigger questions of life. And I think that money, again, creates the bandwidth to explore that stuff. But if we never make the decision to allow our money to do that for us, I don't, I think it, it, it just becomes a journey of numbers and cent, dollars and cents. And I think it could be so much more than that. It's hard. I find myself getting stuck on the money. And if I just save this much more, I'm like, yeah. dude, you don't need to save anything else. Just uh, buy the burrito at the airport if you're hungry. <laughs> Spend the extra 50% on the ripoff burrito. <laughs> Are you, you're still thinking that? I, I do still. <laughs> I, I was telling Doug, I, I bought a beer at the airport and I felt kind of bad about it. But then I'm like, yeah, what the hell? You've got the money. You, you want yeah. the beer? Go I love it. the airport beers though because I know I'm paying too much, but I'm thinking, yeah, it's great. It's on the trip and I'm just going to blow money. I don't know. I I turn off my frugality uh, senses at the airport. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where I heard this quote the other day. It said that money is just a tool. It will take you wherever you want to go, but it won't replace you as the driver. And I think too often we forget that like we're driving somewhere. We need to spend more time questioning that versus the, the tool that we're using to get there. Yep. So we talked a little bit earlier about how financial independence challenged you to be creative. Is it challenged you? And what other ways does financial independence cause us to challenge ourselves? Mm. I think it opens the opportunity for us to take risks if we choose to take that risk. You know, to me, deciding to quit my job, it's a huge risk. You know, I, I started the economy conference, which is a huge risk. You know, walking the Camino in certain ways was a huge risk. And I think we we create opportunities to take those risks that are, they're almost like measured risks because we have this safety net of money that can kind of catch us if we're wrong. It's a it's a really privileged place to be, to to be able to make these big decisions and know you have a safety net. But I think so often we, we get scared to do that. And I myself feel that way too. I think I've got to push through a lot of fear and just push myself to do these things because I recognize the benefit of challenging yourself is where all the growth is. That's where you learn things about yourself. That's where you get insights about 
you know, where your demons are and, and what insecurities you want to overcome. And, you know, if we never challenge ourselves, I don't think we ever get to see like the full, our full potential. And so the path to FI and, and having the money to be able to use as a tool in, in that pursuit, I think is so valuable. Yeah, that's so good. Nothing, Ellen Donegan uh, once said, nothing great comes when you stay in your, in your comfort zone. He said it much more eloquently than that, but I think <laughs> about that every day because it applies to mental pursuits, it applies to physical pursuits. If you want to run a marathon, you're going to have to be in pain and you're going to have to get outside that comfort zone. But yeah, it's so rewarding when you do that. And... I was going to say, thanks. You fed us a couple questions. So that's why Carl and I are reading these. So, uh, you know, we're very straightforward. We, we appreciate you doing the homework for us. People pursuing FI tend to be pretty goal oriented. What have you learned about goals so far in your journey? Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned before, like approaching goals sincerely and not seriously, I am really working hard on that. I think I tend to like get overly fixated on a goal and I like miss the messages along the way. And the way I'm trying to see goals now is it it helps orient you towards a direction, but actually reaching that goal might not be the most important part. Like you can shoot for the moon and land among the stars and that's still pretty fucking good. Right. So like, I'll give you an example this week, I'm finishing up this challenge. That was my biggest goal this year. And it was to complete the 75 hard. Do you guys know what that is? I've yeah. heard of that. Yeah. It's a fitness yeah. challenge. Correct. Yeah. Well, it's branded as a mental toughness challenge, but it's pretty much a fitness challenge. So you do two 45 minute workouts every day. One needs to be outside. You drink a gallon of water every day. You read 10 pages of a personal development book, subscribe to comp some kind of diet that includes no alcohol and take a progress picture. So, I mean, the biggest parts of it are probably like the workouts and the diet. And so I... I have wanted to do this for years. And I told myself, if I ever lost my job or left my job, the first thing I would do is the 75 hard because I felt the need to like ground myself in something. And I had, I would then have the space in my life to do it, like no excuses. Right. And so I set out to do this. And one of the best things that I think came out of it is on a whim, I just decided that I wanted to do this with a group. And I posted on my Facebook, like, I'm doing this thing. I think it'd be more fun to like check in daily with a group of people who wants to do it with me. And lo and behold, there's like five of us in this group. And of course, they're all five people that I've met at like Camp Fi or different events, right? I think actually, I think everyone, aside from Lynn, who I met at Camp Mustache, she'll be in Colorado Springs with us this weekend. Um, but everybody else I met in Colorado Springs probably in the last two years at Camp Fi. So that's pretty funny that those are the people who are attracted to this challenge. But I failed this goal. I probably did 75% of the 75 hard. The last day is on Friday. So technically, according to the rules, I failed. However, I've lost 15 pounds. I've exercised way more than I would have otherwise. I've eaten way better than I would have otherwise. Um, not drinking alcohol was a part of it. And I actually haven't had a drink in nine months. I just broke that like two weekends ago. But not drinking alcohol for a long period of time, like that was a challenge that I learned a lot from. So like I didn't hit the goal, but I got a ton out of it. And I think I'm learning more about goals that even if you don't get the attended intended result or reach that thing that you thought you were going to reach, like just the, just the striving towards it is still a worthy endeavor. And I'm, I beat myself up over these ambitious goals that I set for myself. And I think a lot of us on the path to fire are a little over ambitious and I just am learning. And I guess I want to encourage other people to like hold these goals more gently and recognize that it's like, the purpose of the goal is to set the direction and then you can kind of let it go a little bit and not hold it so tightly. 
That's awesome. I, well, congrats on completing the 75 days and you could go back to your normal stuff. <laughs> um, which is exactly what I was, I would do, but uh, I've heard of this, uh, 75 hard. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've heard of it, but I'm generally turned off cause I'm a very like, well, exactly what we're talking about. We're like very goal oriented. And if I'm going to mess it up, then I'm, and if I'm not going to plan on getting a hundred percent, I don't even want to start it. So yeah. it's, it's really enlightening for you to say that. And if, I mean, I feel like generally if you're trending in the right direction, it, it's pretty good. And that's exactly like where, where it got you. So yeah, pretty amazing. It's like doing something sloppy is better than not doing it at all. That perfectly said. Yeah, I would definitely do do a sloppy job with a 75 heart. <laughs> I, I really liked what you said there. The purpose, I'm going to restate it here. Or, uh, I'm going to repeat it. The purpose of the goal is to set the direction. I like that because I'm the same way as you, Doug. I set these binary goals and I either have to do it. It's like all or nothing, but it's pretty... Like I'm studying Spanish now and I'm studying the piano, but if I can't speak fluently to, to someone or if I can't play the Chopin piece, what does it matter? I'll still be a, a lot better off when I go to a foreign country and I'll have gained something from practicing the piano. So it doesn't have to be that silly one or zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about economy. What, awesome. What is this My talk? favorite subject. <laughs> yes. Tell us about it. <laughs> so... Economy really originated from me asking myself, what would I do with my time if I didn't have to work for money? You know, when I was getting really excited about pursuing FI and I had my goal and my, you know, timeline and it, I, I recognized that I wasn't going to just sit around and do nothing all day. And I saw pursuing FI as like not necessarily not working anymore, but separating my work from my finances. And to me, it opened up a really big opportunity for like, if I didn't have to worry about money, what would I want to create? And I was really inspired by World Domination Summit. As I mentioned earlier, you know, every time I go to that event, I leave feeling like my life is so full of possibility. And I wanted to create that for other people about money. Like I wanted them to feel that way about their money because I just think it's such an incredible resource. And so this was supposed to be my like early retirement project, but I just got so damn excited about it. I couldn't wait. And I'm so glad that I didn't wait because it's, it's a really risky endeavor. And there, it, there's a lot of like, you don't know what you don't know until you really get into it. And so I think having um, a six-figure income with a 60% savings rate gave me a lot of bandwidth to like make my mistakes. I ended up taking a 40 grand loss my first year and I like didn't even feel that financially, honestly. Like that's what I would have put in my after-tax brokerage. I was still fully funding all of my retirement vehicles. I had a very healthy emergency fund you know, I was still had my down payment for my house, you know, it, that was just, it was kind of like my extra money that I would have put in my after-tax brokerage. Um, so, but if I would have waited until I reached five to do that, and I didn't have like the strong income, I don't think I would have taken that risk. I think I probably would have canceled it and said, you know what? Ticket sales don't justify the ridiculous cost of this event. There's not enough demand for it. I need to move on. I had the privilege of looking at it as this is an investment, almost like, you know, like a restaurant. A lot of restaurants aren't profitable for, you know, three to five years. And so I looked at at this as I want to build it up to, you know, be a self-sustaining business. And I'm and I'm I have the bandwidth to kind of take on that risk in the beginning. But yeah, economy is to me very much about creative expression. Like I just had this vision of a vibe. And it's crazy. Like there's this one picture of the room because we had the first event on March 7th of 2020, one week before everything shut down. Insane. Like I I'm telling you, I dodged a bullet. It took me 20 months to plan this event. If I would have had to cancel it, I would have been devastated. So I got very, very lucky. Um, but I, there's this one picture of the room with like, 
I had these like lights with my logo projected on the walls and like the lighting of the room. And I had like a music designer and the way the chairs were and the set design and just the vision of this room to actually have a picture of it. Like I saw this in my head way before it actually materialized in real life. There's something so thrilling about that to be able to create something. Um, And when I talk to people that tell me how the event impacted them, it just, it's so satisfying because I think about how Mr. Money Mustache impacted me. He changed my life just because he decided to type into a computer one day. Like the idea that I could do that for someone else, that I could um, be like the jumping off point for someone to go create something beautiful is really just insane. Like there's this guy that just told me the other day, he's now kind of like an influencer within personal finance. He's doing all these TikTok videos where he's got like a million followers on TikTok. And he got into this through the economy conference. It was like, he was, he was very interested. Um, you know, he read, um, is it Scott Trench's book, right? Set for Life. He listened to Choose Fi. Like he definitely was already interested, but it was the first event he ever went to. And he met a real estate agent there that got him into his first um, investment uh, property. And he's like building from there. So, you know, there's that. There's just the people that tell me how many friends they made, all the ideas that they got that came out of it. Um, one of the speakers actually, she was a minimalist, uh, coach and kind of a simplicity coach. And I exposed her to the fire movement and she was a Dave Ramsey person. And that kind of pushed her to graduate beyond Dave Ramsey. And now next year she's moving to Malaysia with her family and retiring early. Like that is like mind blowing to me that that something like that could come out of this like idea for an event that I had. So anyway, economy is very much about inspiration and community. Like, yes, we have amazing speakers. Carl is going to be a speaker. You know, we've got this great main stage and it is, it is like a show. It's a production. There's lighting, there's music, there's, you know, it's, it's a, a performance essentially, but There's also a ton of knowledge in the room. It's not just the main stage speakers. And so we have these breakout sessions where you you get to kind of network and talk to the other people in the room. Um, So yes, amazing performance, but also a lot of um, opportunity to connect with like-minded people. And I just can't stress enough how important it has been for my journey to find community. Almost all of my friends today are like five people. It's really amazing. Like when people talk about like, oh, I'm struggling with this because all of my friends just want to spend money all the time and they don't get it and I don't have anyone to talk to. Like I can't, I can't really relate to that because all of my people are five people and I've met them all by going to these kinds of events. And I really do think it's a way to like supercharge your journey because you're just surrounded by knowledge, but also it makes it so much more fun. The Phi community are some of the most creative, interesting people I've ever met. And this is like an excuse for us to get together and party. I could have said that exact same thing, Diana, about the community part. And I used to feel bad about myself. I used to think I was a loser. Like, how come I I still have friends from before I discovered Phi, but I don't talk to them that much. Like most of the people I see on a day-to-day basis are somehow connected to the Phi community. And many of them, I've never gone to anything like a camp. I've never been to a camp of Phi or, uh, or any of these other Phi events without coming back with friends. And when I say friends, they're not people that I talked to and we're great. And then I never see him again. We had someone sleep over last night who was yeah. someone I met in Ecuador, who was someone that I connected with through Alan Donegan through a financial independence event. I think that one was through the Choose FI group. So, and speaking at this thing, it freaks me out a little tiny bit because there's going to be a lot of people there more than I've ever spoken to. But more than that, it gives me energy because I know I'm speaking to a room of friends. There just ha- there might not be friends that I have not talked to yet, and it, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, yeah, I'll, if I could summarize these events and a reason to go to Economy, in one word, it would be community. 
I think the people who go there will definitely gain something. They'll be entertained by the speakers, hopefully myself. Hopefully they don't go running for the doors. <laughs> so they'll gain something and be entertained from that. But what most of them will leave with is the community. They'll have connections. They'll have friends. They'll hang out after economy is done. And that's going to be what they take away from it. Um, so yeah. 100%. Yeah. I One of my favorite quotes about community is if you look at your inner circle and you're not inspired, then you don't have a circle. You have a cage. Wow. That just resonates so much with me because the people around us influence us. And I told you earlier about how I think sometimes they influence me a little bit too much. But I think that just demonstrates the importance of hand picking the people that you want to influence you. Absolutely. The people who you talk to and who you work with. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I dropped my, my point. I was going to say, I felt bad about myself because all my friends were from the FI community. But then I realized FI is a, a big filter. If we have financial independence in common, there's probably a lot of other shit we have in common too. Maybe we're, we're willing to do underwear exchanges. Maybe, maybe not so much that one, but we're willing to, uh, we, we don't care so much about certain things and we care about other things more. Um, and that's a big filter. And when you meet these people, a lot of us are introverts, but you feel like you have friends almost instantly because they've passed through that Mr. Money Mustache or Economy or Campify filter and you feel yeah. pretty much comfortable with them almost from the get-go. But there's yeah. people I've known my whole life that I still don't enjoy talking to. <laughs> It's very similar to like the Camino. I talked about that instant sense of camaraderie because we're on this kind of common journey. Like we're, we're walking towards the same goal. And I think that's really similar to the people that you meet on the FI journey. You know, we're all walking and striving towards something similar, but we're doing it in our own unique way. And I think there's just so much value in being able to share that with other people and learn about how other people are approaching it. Yeah. So give us the details on economy, when, where, and what is going to happen there. You talked about that yeah. a little bit, but how about you elaborate a bit? Sure. So it's happening on November 13th and 14th of this year at the University of Cincinnati. And we're starting off the festivities on actually Friday night, which is the 12th. Last year, we didn't have any programming during this time. It was just everybody kind of get in and start the conference the next morning. But Joe Salcihai is one of our speakers, and he's actually kicking off his um, tour for live tapings of the Stacking Benjamin show. And he's going to kick it off at the Economy Conference. So Friday night, we're going to have that, um, a live uh, taping of the Stacking Benjamin show. And then the bulk of the performance aspect happens on Saturday. So it's like a full day on Saturday. We do um, two blocks of main stage speakers, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, and then kind of in between all of that will be the breakout sessions. Um, and the breakout sessions are anything from, you know, I'm doing one with uh, if anyone knows Frank Vasquez, he's really kind of popular in the different financial independence groups on like Facebook, for instance. Um, he's going to talk about asset allocation. We do them on investing. We do them on um, healthcare. Like there's just a ton of different breakout sessions on different topics. I'm actually thinking of doing one, um, one of the breakout sessions to be speed dating for all those five singles out there. Uh, that's kind of a new idea that popped up. So I'm actually going to be running a survey as we get closer of the attendees who've bought tickets to say like, what do you guys want to see? Because right now I've got like 20 different options for breakout sessions just based on ideas that I've collected over the last year. So breakout sessions um, are definitely a huge part of the event. And then we close out the day with an after party on Saturday. And then on Sunday are, are, is what I call kind of post-event activities. So we'll probably do more breakout sessions on Sunday. Um, but we do a walking tour of the city. Um, that is around three hours where you get to like see why Cincinnati is so great. Um, last year we did a brewery tour, which I think we might do again, but depending on the size of the audience, we may have to like break it up into uh, a couple different sessions or, or locations. Cincinnati is really well known for craft beer, 
we have like over 50 independent craft breweries. So that's like a great thing to explore in Cincinnati. And then last year we did a dog park meetup. Uh, I think we might do something a little bit different. There's some farms outside of Cincinnati that we may try to like go to a farm and do a cooking class or something like that. I'm still working out some of the post event activities on Sunday. Um, but it is a jam packed weekend. It is, it is a lot. I heard from people last year that they were just exhausted because it's a lot to take in. So yeah, I hope everybody joins us. Awesome. And then you're, you're going a little early, you said? Yeah, I think I'll probably go maybe on Wednesday or Thursday. So I, perhaps I can help you out and, uh, I'd like to see more of the city, uh, Get yeah. there ahead of time and explore Cincinnati a bit. Mm. Except maybe I'll pass on the Skyline Chili. Although I feel like <laughs> you gotta try it. Well, now yeah. you gotta try it. I, yeah. I have to try it so I can diss it with authority. It's funny we talked about that because Mindy, as a child, had read about that and made her parents drive like 80 miles out of the way. And I was kind of curious <laughs> to hear what you were gonna say about it, but her whole family was pissed off at her. <laughs> They're like, this sucks. Cincinnati, I'm sure you're great and Maybe I'll like the chili, but yeah. Um, so send the hate mail to my wife if you don't like that comment. <laughs> Very cool. And we'll, uh, of course, link up so people can find the information easily. And yeah, any other thoughts on economy? Well, last year, someone described it as a party about money. And that is just the vibe that I was going for. Um, if you're curious of kind of like the that vibe and kind of the, some of the content, you can also go to the Economy Conference YouTube channel. Just search Economy Conference. And remember, Economy is with an M-E, not an M-Y, because as you know, from the spelling of my first name, I really enjoy misspelled words. Uh, so yeah, go to the YouTube channel and you'll see some of the amazing speeches from last year. I put that all up just like Ted talks. You can, you know, watch them. Um, but that'll give you a good idea of what the content is. We really try to have a good mix of inspiration plus more tactical stuff. So like, for example, last year, Travis Hornsby did this amazing presentation on student loan debt. It was like very tactical. Whereas, uh, Rose Lunsbury did a uh, talk about the concept of how much is enough and not just enough money, but how much is enough stuff or friends or achievement or that kind of stuff. So some of it is a, a little bit more inspirational, some's more tactical, but it's, I really try to curate a lineup that's going to have something for everyone. And that also may present some unexpected ideas that we don't normally hear in the Phi community. Very cool. Anything else? Yeah, awesome. I can't wait for it. One other thing I'll add to that is I've never, I feel like I live in this FI thing and I, I write a blog and we've got this podcast and I always feel like um, I've got nothing more to learn. But I always come out of these events, not only inspired, but having learned something that uh, that surprises me. I'm always surprised by what I come out of at these things. So yeah, I can't wait for this. It's going to be incredible. Uh, Doug, if, uh, if you go, will you participate in my talk? I've got one uh, opportunity for a potential uh, participant in my talk. Yeah. Sounds good. I'm okay. in. Okay, cool. I don't know what it entails, but uh, yeah, I'll go in blindly. Yeah. Sounds good. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. Thank you. you. You both went in blindly on my talk, although you don't know it yet. My talk for this weekend. I'll, I'll save that for this weekend. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about this. So that's good. All right. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, do you have anything else here? Um, uh, you talked about fear a little bit. So one final question for me, you're a, you're a very gregarious, brave, um, go-getter person. You talked a little bit about fear, but what do you fear in life? Um, well, it's funny that you see me that way because I feel like I'm constantly battling my fear. Um, I think that I've just kind of maybe learned to tolerate it a little better and I've allowed, I think, my curiosity to be slightly bigger than my fear because I feel like there is something on the other side of it. And I'm I'm very curious about what that is. Because when you overcome certain fears, like, you know, the fear of walking the Camino by myself or, you know, moving to a new city, it's almost like you build up a resilience for it that you can continue to poke at and test. And even though it's challenging, I just think about the alternative. 
what's the alternative for me to just like never challenge myself and, you know, sit back and it just sounds a little boring, right? I think as challenging as these things can be and, and to poke at your fear, um, I think that's, it's also really rewarding. Yeah. You mentioned one other thing, which, uh, my final thought, which I think is pretty important. You mentioned considering fear in the, in light of the worst case scenario and whenever you think of the worst case scenario in life, it's not that bad. For example, you mentioned economy, you lost a bunch of money on it the first year. So the worst case scenario is the things a flop, you lose a bunch of money and then you don't do it again. But so that's the downside. And depending on who you are, you might consider that significant downside or not so much, but the upside is incredible. Like you could create something that in five years is changing people's life, like similar to World Domination Summit or FinCon where you have auxiliary events. There's a website, you have maybe more than maybe more than one event per year. You have Facebook groups and people meeting up. So the the upside usually cancels out the worst case scenario. And the thing I've also found in my life is that I'm a warrior. I always think about the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario never actually really happens. Uh, there, there's a Mark Twain quote that I really like, uh, and it goes, I've spent most of my worry with life worrying about things that never happened. And so true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, this, the, I think the title of this podcast is I can do hard things. And I really feel that economy is the hardest thing I've ever done in ways that I wouldn't expect. Um, but as hard as it's been, it, it's like it, it enabled me to see the best version of myself, even if it was only a glimpse, you know, I got to see the best and worst sides of myself in taking on this project. So to me, that makes it worth it. Even if I lose a bunch of money, like I'll go make more money. It's fine. Very cool. That's awesome. That's all I have, Doug. That was, <laughs> I think I came out with like about 15 different things to put on t-shirts just based on this thought. I'll share, I'll totally share it with you. I'll ask you for your permission and we'll, we'll do this. We'll license it. It'll be the economy store. Like the curiosity was it. bigger than my fear. Oh my God. I would totally wear that. All right. Where can people find you? Yeah. Head on over to economyconference.com and remember that M-E, not M-Y in economy. And there you can learn all about the event. You can sign up for my mailing list. Um, you can check out the full speaker lineup. You can buy tickets and come party with me in November. All right. Thanks so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Campify two years ago, Rocky Mountain. Right. And they're not able to make it this year because they have something else to do, but we are going, they're going to drive us back to Denver on Monday. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So it's going to be a party. Nice. Let me uh, grab my water. What did I do with it? This is why I can't have nice things. <laughs> you couldn't have gone too oh, far with it. All right. Okay. I think, I think we're in a good spot here. Okay. Yeah, this will work. Do we look okay, Diana? Yeah, you look very relaxed. Oh, really? Me or Carl? <laughs> Just like with your feet up and like the whole setup. <laughs> I think it's awesome. I love it. Thanks. It, you know what? It is nice down here. And um, we would have Georgie, my dog, down here as well. But she's going to go on a walk later. So we didn't want her barking too much. But that's yeah. gonna, we actually got a good comment on that, uh, having Georgie in. Yeah, I and saw that. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, it is very relaxed down here, Diana. If we fall asleep, just shout in the if we fall asleep in the middle of the recording. It, it would we would put ourselves to sleep. You would not put us to sleep. That was not <laughs> an insult on your part. It's all good. So I love the mood lighting in the back too. The string lights really tie it Thanks. all together. 